You've heard a lot of prating and prattling about this being the age of specialization. Well, I'm a carpenter by trade. At one time, I could have built a house, a barn, a church, or a chicken coop. But I seen the need of a specialist in one particular line. So I studied her. I got her. She's mine. Ladies and gentlemen, you are face to face with the champion privy builder of the county. customer. One day he calls and says, Lem, I wish you'd come out here. I'm having privy trouble. You see, he'd heard about me specialising and he decided to take a chance. So I'd built for him just the average one-holer. And with that job, my reputation was made. But as I explained to Luke, when I finish a job I ain't through, oh no. I gives all my customers six months privy service, free, gratis. in the middle of stacking time and them hired hands was going in there and they were staying anywhere from 40 minutes to an hour think of that oh. You sure have got privy trouble. So I takes my kit of tools and I goes out to examine the structure. seat and I see at once what the trouble was. I'd made that hole too darn comfortable. Thank <laughs> you. 
boy cuts it square with hard edges. <laughs> I goes back and I takes up my position as before. I watch them hired hands going in and out. And not one of them was staying more than four minutes. Luke, I says, I've solved her. That's what comes of being a specialist. One day, farmer Elmer Ridgeway come to see me. He says, Lamb, he says, I seen that eight hole job you done down there at the school and that sure is dandy. So I thought I'd ask you to kind of estimate on a job for me. You come to the right man, Elmer, I says. I'll be along as soon as I gets the roof on this one I'm a putting up for the whole chief constable. Well, a couple of days later, I drives out to Elmer's place, get in there about dinner time. I see they got company. So, not wishing to disturb him, I just sneaks round to the side door and I yells, Helma, where do you want that privy put? <laughs> Helma comes out and we gets to talking about a good location. He was all for putting her right alongside a big apple tree. Oh, I wouldn't do that, Elmer, I says, and I'll tell you why. Uh, being near a tree is bad. There ain't no sound in nature so disconcerting as the sound of apples are dropping on the roof. And then another thing I says, the soil there ain't adapted to absorbing moisture. During the rainy season, she's likely to be slippery. Take your grandpappy. Going out there is about the only recreation he gets. He'll go out some night with his nighties a-flapping around his legs, and like as not, he'll skid off one of them curves. And when you comes out in the morning, you'll find him wound up in the corn crib. No, sir, he says. Put her in a line with the house. And if it's all the same to you, have her go past the woodpile. Now, I tell you why. Take a woman, for instance. Especially a timid one. If she sees any menfolk around, she's too bashful to go direct out. So she'll go to the woodpile, pick up the wood, go back to the house, and watch her chance. I know the average timid woman to make as many as 10 trips to the woodpile before she goes in, regardless. On a good day, you'll have your wood box filled by noon. And right there is a saving of time. Now then, about the digging. I says, dig her deep and dig her wide. It's a mighty sight better to have a little privy over a big hole than a big privy over a little hole. And another thing, when you dig her deep, you got her dug and you ain't got that disconcerting thought of stealing over you that sooner or later you'll have to dig her again.
Now, when it comes to construction, I says, first you got to anchor her. I puts a four by four that runs straight down five feet into the ground. If you don't, come the Halloween party, them boys is going to get in there in fours and sixes, a singing and a drinking and the like. And they'll upset her. And another thing. I can give you joists or beams. Beams cost a bit more, but they're worth it. Beams, you might say, will last forever. Of course, I could give you joists, but take your Aunt Emmy. She ain't getting a mite lighter. Someday she might be out there when them joists gives way. And there she'd be. Catch. Now, I says, how do you want the door to swing? Opening in or out? Well, he didn't know. So I says it should open in. This is the way it works out. Place yourself in there. The door opening in, say, about 45 degrees. This gives you air and lets the sun beat in. Now, if you hear anybody coming, you can give it a quick shove with your foot. And there you are. And another thing, I never use knotty timber. You take a knot hole. If it don't fall out, it'll get pushed out. And if it comes in the door, nine times out of ten, it'll be too high to sit there and look out, but just the right height for some snooper to peek in. And there you are, catched. Now then, about the ventilators, or the designs I cuts in the doors. I can give you stars, diamonds, or crescents. There ain't much choice. All gives good service. A lot of people like stars because they throws a ragged shadow. Last year we was cutting a lot of stars, but this year people are kind of quietening down and running more to crescents because they're graceful and simple. But you'd best be sure before it's too late because when I cut them, they're cut. And you can get mighty tired sitting there day after day looking at a ventilator that ain't to your liking. Now, about our furnishings. The technical question is this. How long will the average mail order catalogue last? It stumped me for a spell, but this being a reasonable question, I checked up. And I found that by placing the catalogue in there, say, in January, when you get your new one, you should be halfway through by June. But, of course, that ain't through Apple time, and not counting too many city visitors, either. As to the latch for her, I can give you a spool and string, or a hook and eye. The cost of a spool and string is practically nothing, but they ain't reliable. If somebody comes out and starts rattling the door while you're sitting there pondering, either the spool or the string is apt to give way. And there you are. But with a hook and eye of the best quality, she's yours, you might say, for the whole afternoon if you're so minded. Now then, about the painting of her. I could paint her any one of half a dozen colours and they'd all be mighty pretty, but it ain't practical to use a single solid colour. So I'd paint her a bright red 
with white trimmings. Then she'll match up nice in the daytime, and you can spot her easy at night when you ain't got much time to go scouting around. Well, time passed, and I finally got Elmer's job done. And ladies and gentlemen, everybody says that next to my eight-holer, that's the finest piece of construction work in the county. Sometimes, when I get to feeling blue and thinking I hitched my wagon to the wrong star, and maybe I should have took up the chiropractory or the veterinary, I just pack up and I start out aiming to fetch up at Elmer's place along about noon. There's a lot of fine points to putting up a first-class privy that the average man don't think about. It's no job for an amateur, you take my word for it. to the top of the hill overlooking Elmer's place. I slips the gear into mutual and just sits there looking at that beautiful sight. There stands that privy near the woodpile, painted red and white with morning glories of growing up over her and Mr. Sun bathing her in a burst of yellow colour. As I look at that beautiful picture of my work, I heave a sigh of satisfaction. My eyes fills up and I says to myself, I know I done right in specialising. I'm sitting on top of the world. No, Elmer don't have to worry. He's a boy that's got himself a privy. A mighty, mighty pretty privy. <laughs> Thank you.